Gonorrhea remains one of the more common sexually transmitted infections. In North America, the number of reported cases has generally risen for over 10 years with interruptions in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, followed by returns to rising rates of infection. Under the selective pressure of antimicrobial treatment, antimicrobial resistance has risen, which has led to limited options for treatment. Today, we will be discussing antimicrobial resistance in Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea, including these questions. How accurate is gradient diffusion susceptibility testing when compared to agar dilution results? Should we use analysis of whole genome sequencing results or agar dilution phenotypic results as the gold standard for antibiotic susceptibility testing of Neisseria gonorrhea? And finally, what is the utility of beta-lactamase testing for predicting penicillin susceptibility results in Neisseria gonorrhea? Welcome to Editors in Conversation. I'm your co-host, Alex McAdam, Editor-in-Chief of JCM. You can find JCM at jcm.asm.org. If you are a member of ASM, you can get up to 50% off the publication fees when you publish in JCM or any of the ASM journals. I am joined, as always, by co-host and fellow JCM editor, Dr. Ellie Thiel from the Mayo Clinic. Ellie, how are you? I'm pretty good. How are you, Alex? I am just fine. Thank awesome. you. What was that huge, bold writing on your mug? On my mug? Yeah. Well, what is that? that's an excellent thing to bring up in an audio recording. And also video, <laughs> for those that follow us. <laughs> so for those who are listening while you're out for your run or whatever, my mug says, it's a beautiful purple mug that says in big yellow letters, shall not be denied. Hmm. Women fight for the right to vote. And it's from the Library of Congress. So this is from the women's suffrage movement. Oh. Um, and I picked it up on a visit to Library of Congress. I have been told, because you can't really read the small part where it says the women fight for the vote. You can just read the big yellow shall not be denied letters. Oh. I've been told to be careful with this mug and not to use it in very um, important meetings. My coach told me to avoid it because it might stimulate thought in the wrong direction. It sounds bossy, she said. Well, I wonder what your coach would think about my mug. What does your mug say? It's the 5K wine run. <laughs> this is what I, I only have done one 5K in my life, and uh, it's mostly so I could drink wine when it was over. <laughs> was that for hydration afterwards? Um, yes, hydration and the prize that you finished <laughs> and completed. So I probably shouldn't use this for important meetings either. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check with my coach next time I see her. I'll ask her. We digress. <laughs> I'll report back. Well, we are joined by return guest, Dr. Tannis Dingle. Dr. Dingle is a clinical microbiologist at Alberta Precision Laboratories and a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Calgary. Tannis, it is great to have you back. Thanks so much for having me. And I think I should say that you're very brave to come back because the last time you came on, the person who was supposed to appear with you got stuck in traffic and you had to do the whole thing solo. Yes, it was a bit nerve wracking, but but you both made me feel so comfortable. So thank you. <laughs> it was great. You really, you really were. But thanks and thanks for coming back. And this time your um, colleague has materialized and we are joined by first time guest, Dr. Angela Ma. Dr. Ma is a clinical microbiologist at Public Health Ontario. Angela, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Very excited to be here. The two of you have a paper in the current issue of JCM, and the title is Use of Genome Sequencing to Resolve Differences in Gradient Diffusion and Agar Dilution Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing Performance of Neisseria gonorrhea in Isolates, excuse me, Isolates in Alberta, Canada. We will put a link to that paper in the show notes. Before we talk about the paper, just a reminder to listeners that this is a conversation that is largely unscripted, and you should always look to the paper to get the full story. Tanis, why don't we begin with you? How has the recommended antimicrobial treatment of gonorrhea changed over time? Perfect. So, um, historically, penicillin, tetracycline, and ciprofloxacin were recommended first-line treatments for uh, gonococcal infection. 
Um, and unfortunately, and really not surprisingly, resistance developed over time to these agents. So for example, penicillin was released in 1941, and penicillin-resistant Neisseria gonorrhea was first detected in 1976. Uh, for ciprofloxacin, it was first released in 1987, and ciprofloxacin-resistant gonorrhea was detected in 2007. So as resistance to these agents increased, they no longer became recommended first-line agents for treatment of gonorrhea. Um, in the United States, dual therapy with a cephalosporin, so cefixime or ceftriaxone plus azithromycin or doxycycline, became the recommended treatment guidance in 2010. Um, however, cefixime was dropped from that guidance in 2013 due to increasing MICs and reports of resistance worldwide. So really, as you can uh, see, Neisseria gonorrhea has managed to become resistant to most first-line recommended agents over time, resulting in uh, changes to treatment recommendations over time. And it seems that almost every three years or so, there's, there's a new treatment recommendation that, that comes out. Thanks, Tana. So with all of this emerging resistance, uh, can you talk about what the current uh, recommended antimicrobial regimens are for treatment of um, gonorrhea in both Canada and the U.S.? So yes, the uh, treatment guidelines are, are different in the Canada, in the Canada, sorry. <laughs> okay. Starting again. So yes, the treatment recommendations for gonorrhea in Canada and the, in the United States are slightly different. So in the United States, the current recommended treatment regimen from the 2021 CDC treatment guidelines for uncomplicated gonococcal infection is a single intramuscular injection of ceftriaxone. And then there are some alternative regimens, which include gentamicin plus azithromycin or gentamicin um, plus cefixime. In Canada, however, uh, the current recommended treatment regimens are slightly different, uh, and monotherapy is actually avoided, and instead dual therapy is currently recommended, which uh, includes cefixime or ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. Which was the recommendation in the U.S. until relatively recently, I think. Right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, Angela, let's turn to you. Tell us what questions you were investigating in the study. Sure. So our primary question was really just how does gradient diffusion differ in its performance to the gold standard being agar dilution? Other studies in the literature have largely compared disk diffusion, which is a method that's recognized by CLSI for Neisseria gonorrhea, um, whereas gradient diffusion isn't. And there's also less studies available, and none of them actually really look at a sample size as large as ours. The study also provided us with an opportunity to look at gonococcal infection Alberta based on epidemiological um, parameters such as age, sex, and specimen source. And then as the study progressed and discordant results between the two methods were identified, it really also provided us an opportunity to evaluate how whole genome sequencing, specifically a tool known as MIC prediction, performs as a unique way of arbitrating discordant results and resolving errors. Thank you. Um, take us through the study design, if you would, please. Yeah, so we firstly obtained all of our AST data for both gradient diffusion that is performed in Alberta and also for agar dilution that's performed at the National Microbiology Laboratory, which is similar to the CDC um, in the U.S. but for Canada, um, from a really large collection of isolates that span over 2,000 and that are tested by both of these methods. Some criteria for the isolates that are to be forwarded from Alberta to um, the National Microbiology Lab include that they are the first isolates from a unique specimen site that's isolated from a patient within the first 15 days of the month. Any isolates with elevated MICs to azithromycin, ceftriaxone, or cefixime, and any isolates from a patient with suspected treatment failure. Beta-lactamase testing by the nitrocephin test was also performed on all of these isolates that get forwarded to the National Microbiology Lab. And then we also do some surveillance work utilizing multi-antigen sequence typing and also whole genome sequencing on a subset of these isolates over at the National Microbiology Lab as well. So before we go on, I just want to make sure it's, it's clear, and I, I think you said it very clearly. Um, this, like many excellent clinical microbiology studies, was kind of a sample of convenience study. Right, so mm -hmm. you were doing your routine clinical testing in the local laboratory, and then select isolates were being sent out to the reference laboratory 
those yeah. select isolates got the got the reference method testing as a check against the gradient diffusion testing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. So kind of a follow-up on that. So gonorrhea, at least in, in our lab and many labs in the US is mostly um, detected by molecular methods, you know, not as many isolates really um, in the US, but you guys had a huge number of isolates that um, you included in your study. How did you come across those exactly? Yeah, so we do utilize molecular testing as our primary method for uh, gonococcal testing in Alberta as well. Cultures primarily performed on a subset of patients for surveillance of resistance and for any susceptibility guided treatment in patients with suspected or confirmed treatment failure, essentially. Okay, thank you. Tanis, there was part of this study that blew my mind, and that was that you used genome sequencing basically as a reference test against which both phenotypic methods were evaluated. Can you explain why that was the right reference method to use rather than using the auger dilution results? So honestly, that's not how this study started out. We really wanted to compare our gradient diffusion or E-test against um, auger dilution. Um, and so auger dilution was meant to be our reference method. However, it was apparent that we would need a method to resolve discrepancies because we actually found quite a few discrepancies between the two methods. And unfortunately, given resource limitations for repeat phenotypic testing and the availability of sequencing results for a significant proportion of isolates tested, uh, we decided that whole genome sequencing might be an appropriate method to resolve these discrepancies. And so um, we worked with Dr. Irene Martin from our Na National Microbiology Laboratory, um, who is one of the co-authors on our paper. And she had co-developed and evaluated an MIC prediction tool for uh, Neisseria gonorrhea based on whole genome sequencing results. And this method was published in AAC in 2020. And given that this method had been robustly evaluated for accurate prediction of Neisseria gonorrhea MICs, it made sense to us to at least try to use this method as a tool for discrepancy resolution. Um, and additionally, just of note, since the end of our study, our National Microbiology Lab has completely moved to genomic MIC prediction over auger, auger dilution for Neisseria gonorrhea isolates sent for AST. I know it, it does sound a bit crazy, but it's true. <laughs> um, and I should, I should note and stress this that um, using genomic MIC prediction as a method for discrepancy resolution is not currently recommended by CLSI in the M52 document. Um, typically, a laboratory would repeat phenotypic testing by both methods or attempt a third phenotypic method as a tiebreaker. Um, however, uh, since we did have a robust MIC prediction tool, um, we thought that it made sense to at least uh, give it a shot and, and see if we could use it to help resolve discrepancies in our evaluation. Thank you. I think it's fantastic. I mean, it, it, and I think we're seeing, I've probably ranted about this before on the podcast. I think we're seeing more and more phenotypic uh, testing being checked against genotypic results with genotypic being the, the gold, gold standard. It started with MECA um, and has now spread out. Um, and this was really one of the most extensive uses of genomic uh, prediction of susceptibility that I have seen in a publication. So I loved it. Yeah. Um, sorry, I got so excited about that. I've lost, I've lost sense of where we are now. <laughs> Angela, can you uh, give us an overview of the susceptibility results? Sure. So this is purely based on the phenotypic testing with gradient diffusion versus agar dilution. Overall, we saw good susceptibilities of greater than 90% in all of our isolates for azithromycin, cefixime, and ceftriaxone for both methods, which is really reassuring. However, there were higher rates of non-susceptible isolates to ciprofloxacin, penicillin, and tetracycline. Um, especially between gradient diffusion and agar dilution, there were differences in susceptibilities with penicillin and tetracyclines. Um, large portion of those did have... Um, disagreements on where they fell, whether they were susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. No. 
sorry, Ray. Um, I should just say so, for the listening audience, we have our quest questions scripted, of course, but the problem is that Ellie and I get too interested in what we're talking about. <laughs> we lose track of where we are. You're up, Ellie. Yes, we we totally lose track of things. But um, sticking with Angela, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how the nitrocephin beta lactamase test predicted susceptibility results um, with penicillin? Yeah, so the nitrocephin test performed quite poorly with our samples. It was not an accurate predictor of penicillin susceptibility at all. You know, over 95% of our isolates were negative by nitrocephin, but less than 10% of the isolates were considered susceptible by gradient diffusion or agar dilution. The majority of the isolates were fell in the range of intermediate um, interpretations. All of the isolates that were positive by nitrocephin, though, um, were either intermediate or resistant by both of those AST methods, but there was a proportion of isolates that lacked beta-lactamase that were resistant to penicillin, and we suspected that it may be due to a number of different reasons. It's well known with Neisseria gonorrhea that there are other mutations, possibly in penicillin binding proteins that can contribute towards resistance to penicillin. And interestingly, there is a variant of the TUM1 plasmid that confers slow hydrolysis to nitrocephin, where it takes about 35 minutes to see a color change um, with that nitrocephin disc that otherwise wouldn't be detected if you're following the package insert or standard SOP. And that may be circulating in the Canadian uh, gonorrhea um, isolates that we were testing. Thank you, Angela. I, those nitrocephin results really surprised me and they sent me straight to the CLSI guideline. Tannis, can you put those results in the context of what CLSI recommends? So yeah, we were equally as surprised as you were. So um, CLSI currently states that a positive nitrocephin test uh, accurately predicts res resistance to penicillin, ampicillin, and amoxicillin. And, and we did see that in, in our study. Um, however, the opposite wasn't necessarily true, as Angela just pointed out. So importantly, CLSI also states that um, the nitrocephin uh, disc test only detects one form of resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea, and that's um, plasmid-mediated beta-lactamase. Um, chromosomally-mediated uh, resistance, so uh, for example, PBP alterations, can only be detected by dis the disdiffusion method or the auger dilution method. And although not really stated in the CLSI documents, this would also extend to gradient diffusion. Thanks, Tana. So kind of diving in a little bit more, um, how exactly did the categorical results of gradient diffusion and agar dilution compare um, when you used agar dilution as your reference method? Yes. Yeah, so first I, uh, here, I just want to stipulate that the results comparing gradient diffusion to agar dilution presented in the paper are prior to discrepancy resolution by whole genome sequencing. So the results I'm going to present right now um, are prior to discrepancy resolution. So first of all, a categorical agreement between the two methods was quite good, actually above our 90% uh, cutoff for azithromycin, cefixime, ceftriaxone, and ciprofloxacin. However, it was below that 90% for penicillin, which was at 86%, and tetracycline, which was quite surprising to us, was 47% categorical agreement between the two methods. Um, when we then looked at errors, so looking at very major errors, major errors, and minor errors um, between the two methods, we saw very nice performance uh, for cefixime and ceftriaxone, which makes sense because we had no resistance in our, our population. Um, ciprofloxacin also had errors well within acceptable limits per CLSI M52. When we looked at penicillin, we saw 14% minor errors, meaning that one result was intermediate and the other result was susceptible or resistant 14% of the time, which is slightly above what we would typically hope for. Uh, we typically hope for minor errors to be less than 10%. Um, but where we saw issues uh, with our errors was with azithromycin and tetracycline. 
So although azithromycin had acceptable categorical agreement, which was about 92%, we saw 18.4% very major errors, meaning uh, false susceptibility by uh, e-test, and 7.7% major errors, meaning false resistance by e-test. And typically we want these, uh, these very major errors and major errors to be less than 3% per CLSI M52 recommendations. However, when we go and talk raw numbers for azithromycin, we tested almost 2,400 isolates, and we only had 38 non-susceptible isolates to azithromycin. So in the grand scheme of things, when we're talking about 18.4% very major errors here, that's actually only seven falsely susceptible isolates in our, in our entire study. Um, so it... I'm, although it's still outside the acceptable limits, it, it is just a very small number because our non-susceptible population was very small. Um, and then for tetracycline, we saw a very high amount of minor errors uh, at about 49%, uh, and we saw additionally some very major errors at 6.2% for tetracycline. Thanks, Tanis. So um, kind of jumping over to you, Angela, can you talk to us about the MIC results of the two uh, phenotypic methods and how they compared? Sure. So if the phenotypic results, when we look at the MICs or the essential agreements, followed very much of the trend that Tanis was describing for our categorical errors. We saw that there was a lot of agreement between gradient diffusion and agar dilution for azithromycin, suffixime, and ciprofloxacin, where we were seeing MICs within one doubling dilutions between the two methods of above 90% for these three agents. When we looked at some of the other antimicrobials such as ceftriaxone, penicillin, and tetracycline, the latter two being more of our problem children of the, what we were seeing, there was a bias towards lower MIC values of two or more doubling dilutions um, below the MIC for agar dilutions seen with gradient diffusion. So that's reflective of possibly some undercalling of resistance for gradient diffusion there. Thank you. Uh, so let's get into it. Angela, what did you find when you investigated the discrepant results in the phenotypic tests using that genotypic analysis? Yeah, so our genotypic analysis method being the MIC prediction pipeline um, that's performed over at the National Microbiology Laboratory, we had a subset of our isolates that did go towards the WGS, and not all of them did, but of those that did, and that had errors associated with these isolates, we were able to resolve about 15% of our penicillin and tetracycline minor errors and 30% of our zithromycin major errors in favor of gradient diffusion. And like Tanis mentioned, because our errors were calculated pre-discrepancy resolution, you know, if we had done this post-discrepancy resolution with the WGS MIC predictions, we would have seen that that would have improved our errors quite a lot. It also allowed us to identify different molecular markers that are associated with different antibiotics. Some of these are shared between agents, such as efflux pumps and porins, which is understandable. And then we also noticed, noticed a number of that are very specific to the antibiotic class, such as gyrase, etc. And overall, with using this tool, it really allowed us to do a lot more discrepancy resolution than we would have been able to if we were limited to phenotypic repeat testing due to the limitations that Tanis mentioned earlier. Very cool, thank you. Um, so Tanis, you guys also looked at the sequence types for Neisseria gonorrhea and how those types correlated to errors in um, antibiotic susceptibility results. Can you talk about what you found there? Yeah, so this is something we just kind of thought to analyze since we had that genome sequencing data and those sequence types, why not take a look to see if there's any correlation uh, between those uh, sequence types and the errors we were seeing. So we did actually find statistically significant associations between azithromycin major errors and tetracycline minor errors um, and sequence type. And so for azithromycin major errors, uh, we found sequence types uh, 12302 and 162A8 were predominant. 
And both of these sequence types have been previously shown to be associated with azithromycin resistance in Canada. And then for tetracycline minor errors, we saw um, ST10451 and 16065 um, uh, being associated with minor errors. And both of these sequence types have also been previously shown to be associated with tetracycline resistance in Canada. So this was kind of just a, a, a uh, an extra analysis that we did that we thought might be interesting. And I, I thought it, we, we showed some interesting results with that. Yeah. Tannis, pull this all together for us. How did the results from this study impact your laboratory processes for Neisseria gonorrhea susceptibility testing? Yeah, so overall, we were actually quite happy with the results for ciprofloxacin, cefixime, ceftriaxone, and penicillin. Um, however, following these results, I think we're quite likely to drop our beta-lactamase test from our protocol, given that we did not find that it predicted uh, penicillin uh, resistance that well. Um, and given that we're already performing susceptibilities to penicillin in our laboratory by gradient diffusion um, for, for surveillance purposes, um, it, it does seem reasonable to, to drop that test from, from our algorithm. Um, for tetracycline, um, given those high minor errors, I think we will likely be dropping e-test for tetracycline. Again, in Alberta, um, tetracycline is only tested for surveillance purposes. It is not reported out on patient reports. Um, and we can still survey um, tetracycline resistance by that whole gen genome sequencing methodology at our National Microbiology Laboratory. And then lastly, for azithromycin, uh, we are going to look at whether disk diffusion might be a better option given those very major errors that we saw. Um, and those very major errors did not uh, resolve by our whole genome sequencing MIC prediction tool. So they did uh, remain after the discrepancy analysis. Um, and we also might test some more non-susceptible isolates just to increase our number of non-susceptible isolates overall that we tested, just to see if, if that very major error rate remains high in our, in our um, isolate population. But definitely for azithromycin, we have to start looking at a different method, I think. Thank you. So we love, the, we love when our research tells us to stop doing things, right? You, you get yeah. to stop doing a couple of things. If I kept track, you get to stop doing two things and you get to switch from a more expensive method potentially to a less expensive method. You can't beat it. Yeah, yeah you got it. This has been really interesting. Ellie, what are we gonna talk about next time? You got it picked out? I do. We are going to continue the, is it two or three year tradition of doing the best of JCM papers. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Do you have a guest uh, picked out for it? I do. Uh, she or he does not know yet, so I'm not going to <laughs> tell you who it is <laughs> All right. in case he or she does not agree. <laughs> yep. Sounds good. Sounds good. I look forward to it. Tannis and Angela, thank you each for joining us. Thanks so much for having us. Yes, thank you. And thank you for listening. <laughs>